This is my first video in a three-part series dedicated towards popularizing the words of science with regards to human biodiversity and I have decided to record this series of mine in order to respond and debunk the fallacious arguments and claims made by ideologues with regards to race. In this video I will debunk the pseudoscientific claims that are unfortunately popular amongst the general population due to several reasons I'll talk about this video and in this series. Also one quick reminder, all sources for this series will be provided in the description below and all information that I have provided is factual and is peer reviewed or from a book and I advise you to check all I had to say for yourself if you have the slightest amount of doubt with regards to what I am about to say. Unfortunately, I will say it straight away that I won't be debunking all pseudoscientific claims about race, including the evolutionism myth narrative, as well as that humans did not originate from Africa or were not black originally, since those myths are already rejected by the educated community and I'm glad that is the case. Instead, I will focus only on the most dangerous myths that are poisoned the current intellectual discourse despite amounts of evidence to the contrary. The claims about race that I'm about to list fall into the category of pseudoscience, such as you can see on your screen, meaning that the proponents of those claims are hostile to criticism, start with a conclusion and work their way up, usage of vague jargon to confuse and make grandiose claims that go beyond the evidence, as well as they cherry-pick evidence, use fraud methods, generally cite their own and work isolated from scientists who disagree with them, use bad logic and are extremely dogmatic when it comes to shutting down other scientists. So hence my preface was completed, without any further chattering. Let's start the video by naming the dishonest scientists that did their best in order to screw up the entire academic field on race research for a very long period of time that only now is recovering due to invention of polygenetic testing, human genome project and more recent experiments and studies in human biodiversity. Those names are Franz Boas, Stephen Gould and Richard Charles Lewontin. Now I won't go into detail on how how they worked together in order to alter the scientific community at the time, you can do it on your own, reading their biography on Wikipedia and pretty much it requires a separate video as they were all intentionally dishonest. However, I will go ahead and examine the arguments and debunk their pseudoscientific claims that they have made during the time that they were alive. In short, all of those dear gentlemen had committed the moralistic fallacy, which is the informal fallacy assuming that that an aspect of nature which has socially unpleasant consequences cannot exist. All of their other fallacious and fraudulent signs stems from that specific fallacy. The first pseudoscientific claim that I want to examine was made by Stephen Gould, just at the same time when the Human Genome Project was completed, and I quote, there's been no biological change in humans in 40,000 to 50,000 years. Everything we call culture and civilization we've built with the same body and brain. So let's look at our first moralistic fallacy that is by the way debunked in the following paragraph of the Scientific American where I got the original quote from. But in any event, to debunk this is so simple that one can just google human recent evolution and move to Wikipedia and the second sentence that you will read will be the following and will be debunking this false assertion. And I quote, Contrary to popular belief, not only are humans still evolving, their evolution since the dawn of agriculture is faster than ever before. It is possible that human culture itself is a selective force, has accelerated human evolution, end of quote. Moreover, human evolution has greatly accelerated in the past 300 years and has radically accelerated in the past 50 years. Now, I won't go into details on that, but the modern supposition is that today evolution is happening approximately 100 times faster than during the average 6 million years of our existence. Yes, you got that right. The founding fathers and the great French revolutionaries did not alter the forces of natural selection 
selection and group selection, as well as minimized human biodiversity when they wrote that all men were created equal. Another fallacious argument that comes out of Stephen Gould's mouth is that racial inequalities that exist, and especially racial inequalities and intelligence, are generally socially constructed or are environmental, and that argument is unfortunately very popular among the scientifically illiterate who get their science from news and opinion outlets such as The Guardian instead of listening to actual expert consensuses or studies and even research. But thankfully, in the past years, enough of research has been generated in order to refute such a statement completely. For my refutation, I will first use this year's survey of experts and then actual research material in order to debunk this harmful assertion. This year's survey that I'm going to use response rate did not differ politically, but it had a very leftward bias, as you can see by the sample. But despite that, they came to the conclusion that black to white genetic difference is 50% genetical and 50% environmental. However, this survey is extremely biased biased to the left, as the 16% of people who have shared their opinion had concluded that the difference between blacks and whites in IQ is 100% environmental, which explains their dogmatism. However, a 100% genetical explanation is also incorrect, as obviously there are social factors that are at play that determine one's level of IQ, so denying that is also pretty dumb. I bring this survey in order to illustrate that even after 80 years of vicious attacks on race research, race realism is not going anywhere, and is present because of mountains of evidence are forcing people to accept the reality, even despite a strong lefty presence that attempts to jeopardize the evidence as well as filibuster all conversations about race. As Noam Chomsky wrote in his language and problems of knowledge, surely people differ in their biological determined qualities, the world would be too horrible to contemplate if they did not. But discovery of a correlation between some of these qualities is of no scientific interest and of no scientific significance except for racists, sexists and alike. In other words, he is saying that all variations within race can only be explained socially and not genetically, and if you think that they partially can be explained biologically, you are a racist as sexist and the alike, and those explanations have no scientific interests and social significance. But to the dismay of Noam Chomsky and other spiteful mutants, race research matters not only for structuring a meritocratic society, but also for medical and other scientific purposes, and there are more scientists working on it than ever before. Moreover, in the same expert survey, 82% of experts had concluded that studies like that lack hidden intentions to discriminate anyone based on their race. Anyways, stemming from that survey of experts, I happen to have a series of peer-reviewed materials that involved research as well as meta-analysis to prove that genetics plays a big role in different groups' achievements. But before I do that, it is important to debunk another myth closely related to heritability and IQ, the myth that was popularized by Sandra Scar, known as as the scarred Rowe effect, which argues that the heritability of IQ with low socioeconomic status is lesser than people of a high socioeconomic status. And as you can guess, it was used by bad faith actors to argue that the difference between whites and blacks' performance is mostly environmental and not genetic. However, this hypothesis is wrong as the conclusions were not replicated, and if you need a meta analysis for this conclusion, rather than a summary on Wikipedia, then there you go. And the conclusion is that environment plays no role to statistically insignificant role in heritability of IQ between races, no matter white or black. Following that, let's test to what extent IQ is heritable or is explained by genes. Is it 15%? Is it 40%? Well, if you ask Google this question, then the heritability of IQ ranges from 57 to 73%. However, with the recent studies reporting 80%. With regards to the IQ being explained by genes, it is 50-80% to 80 explained by genes accordingly to twin studies, 
and moreover according to the massive meta-analysis study of trait heritability all traits are 0.69 heritable while cognitive traits are 0.57 heritable interestingly enough in the same study it was reported that heart functions as well as neurological traits are perfectly heritable meaning one Point zero. In other words, no environmental influence. Alright, now that we have established that intelligence is mostly genetical and not environmental, it is the time to establish beyond any shadow of a doubt that difference in intelligence among races can mostly be explained by genetics and not the environment. But before I do that, it is important to show the progress that science has made in area of race research so far. You see, in 2005, spiteful mutants could have produced this type of paper and get peer-reviewed because at the time there was not really any polygenetic research done that would look at genes influencing intelligence. However, with technological innovation, we can and surely did identify a series of genes that are linked to intelligence, who for now could only explain about 20% difference in intelligence and educational attainment for now. But that is just a start as Testing intelligence requires a combination of different genes and is also epigenetical, that by the way is ancestral for those of you who don't know. But in any event, this data and incoming data that was already used by David Piffer to correlate polygenetic selection with IQ levels of different races in different countries getting a 0.9 correlation. Moreover, in a recent study by the gentleman who you can see on your screen reported that African genetic ancestry predicts lower levels of G factor, which is intelligence, on the genetical level, finally. And the IQ gap will still be the same if you control for socioeconomic status, not even mentioning the adoption studies. But you don't really need that after you have identified specific genes associated with intelligence or a lack thereof. The fact remains the same, there are biological reasons for difference between races in certain outcomes, and they matter more than the environment. Thankfully, in the present day, no scientist can publish a similar study to one of 2005 without other scientists accusing them of fraud and political motivation. Anyways, I want to finish off with Stephen Gould, who has done tremendous damage to the scientific community by popularizing pseudoscience and the way I want to do that is by reading one quote made about him that summarizes his whole dishonest personality and it is the one by Hans Eisenach. How can one trust a person so prejudiced as to neglect overwhelming evidence? But the quote does not only perfectly summarizes him, but unfortunately other science deniers on the left, and even recently Charles Murray, who are not willing to look at recent evidence collected on race. However, I would still recommend reading Human Diversity, The Biology of Gender, Race and Class by Charles Murray as an entry to race realism or human biodiversity, even though he had ignored almost all recent studies on race, possibly out of fear of being treated like James Watson. In any event, that brings us to the last myth of today and the most disingenuous one that many journalists and editors of today repeat pretty often, that even I bought up until only a few months ago because I was reading left-wing sources. That myth is that races have more variations within them than between them. Originally popularized by a fraud by the name of Richard Lewontin in order to conclude that, and I quote, since such racial classification is now seen to be virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance either, no justification can be offered for its continuance. And yet some people, including myself, had believed in the past in this obvious nonsense due to it being often repeated in intellectual circles and especially in the left-wing sources. I guess I had believed in it because I've seen it as soyance, even though on the subconscious level I had trouble buying it. So I trusted soyantists. However, among actual scientists and the overwhelming majority of scientists, yes, the overwhelming majority, this argument is referred to as the Lewontin's fallacy, even on Wikipedia as it has been debunked over and over and over again and since scientists have moved forward. 
but I will still go ahead and debunk that false assertion by citing the conclusion of the biological essay on Lewontin's fallacy. There is nothing wrong with Lewontin's statistical analysis of variation, only with the belief that it is relevant to classification. It is not true that quote-unquote racial classification is of virtually no genetic or taxon taxonomic significance. It is not true as nature claimed that two random individuals from any one group are almost as different as any two random individuals from the entire world. And it is not true as new scientists claim that two individuals are different because they are individuals, not because they belong to different races, and that you can't predict someone's race by their genes. Yeah, those statements were way before 23andMe. Anyways, I'm continuing. Such statements might only be true if all the characters studied were independent, which they are not. The Wanton used his analysis of variation to mount an unjustified assault on classification, which he deplored for social reasons. A proper analysis of human data reveals a substantial amount of information about genetic differences what use, if any, one makes of it is quite another matter." End of quote. In other words, the statement is true when examining the frequency of different alleles between individuals at an individual locus. However, scientists measure genetic similarity over many thousands of loci, and Lewontin's method can pretty much be also applied to comparing Chihuahua and German Shepherd, and thus he will argue that we should not classify them as separate categories but thankfully he is not with us anymore. Real science will show that individuals from one population are never more similar to individuals from different populations than to individuals from their own. Yes, never. Consequently, Lewontin's fallacious argument was even disregarded by Adam Rutherford in his anti-scientific book about how you are racist if you refuse to believe in dogmas that race is a social construction and that there are no racial differences in sports or intelligence or any other matter beyond skin color and maybe bone density, which was pretty funny I guess that even race hustlers and science deniers cannot keep their grift anymore and have to concede more and more territory to race realists who, by the way, just recently had completed the study of average genetic distance between populations, which was published in literally all major scientific journals and magazines. Here is one from Nature, where you can clearly see that population differ from each other. In other words, an average German is similar to another average German than to an average Italian. Here is, for example, the genetical distance of an average German from an average Russian, only point 0.003, yet the real-life differences are remarkable. The same with Ashkenazi Jews, who differ from Germans by about 0.007, while the difference between Germans and Palestinians is 0.016. However, if you go further and compare an average European with an average African, then you will get the genetic distance of 0.15. While if you compare an average Chinese with an average African, the distance will almost be 0.2. And those kinda are very big numbers, that even in the case of dogs and wolves and other animals, we consider them to be enough to categorize them as a different species, but that is a video for another day. Ultimately, I feel like I had debunked the most dangerous pseudoscientific claims made with regards to race by dishonest actors. On the positive note, I'd like to say that science is moving forward and any type of racial denial would be more and more screwed as we progress further and further into the future. If you have not been convinced by what I had to say in this video, feel free to criticize it, but don't forget to provide a study that will claim that race differences are 100% environmental, because extraordinary claims, at least for me, would require some studies, preferably a meta-analysis, which, uh, by the way, you will never get, but you can prove me wrong. On the final note, I'd like to say one side has 
all the data and studies that are replicable and numerous and as we see from the survey is not politically motivated, while the other has none to argue that race differences are over 80% environmental or that it doesn't exist and instead tries to use faulty logic and dishonest tactics and is mostly concerned with critiquing and shutting down the studies and the research of the former scientists in order to push a political agenda and escape the feeling of cognitive dissonance. But thankfully, it's going to be harder and harder for them to keep their grift with every passing year as more and more evidence would accumulate if that wasn't enough.